Annyeong SAO. Welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, three American romance novelists discussing all things K-romance from a writer's lens. We fangirl over our favorite actors and actresses, talk up our trope addictions, and nerd out on K-drama deep dives. We'll throw in a few K-pop and K-skincare wrecks for good measure, because why not ride the haul you wave all the way to shore? So grab some duck bokey and listen to your new favorite unnees. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi there. So, Leah, where are you? (laughs) It sounds lovely. Yes, it's very lovely. I am about five miles north of Cairns, which doesn't probably mean a whole lot to you, but it will for folks who, you know, know Australia or listening from Australia. So basically, if you look at a map of Australia, you'll see there's kind of like a triangle at the top on the east coast. So I'm on that triangle. (laughs) So very far up in the tropics now and at the gateway to the Great Barrier Reef. So I'm really excited. We're going to get to go see the reef. We're going to go out and do two trips. And we're staying in a little village called Yorkie's Knob, which is cute. It's named after like a Yorkman who used to like live on the coast over here. But it's also funny because knob also can mean penis. So there's lots of jokes in our house about the fact that we're at Yorkie's Knob right now. And, you know, it's warm here. The water is pretty warm. Like you get in, it's a little bit cold, but then like immediately it feels good. However, it's disconcerting because... You know, I'm with my kids. I'm at the beach. There's the lifeguard and they set up flags. So the big thing in Australia is where there's beaches with, you know, swimmers and the lifeguards, they'll set up flags and say swim between the flags. And that's kind of where we're monitoring. So you can go anywhere you want, but like, that's not on us. Like, so when I'm with the kids, I'll often go between the flags, especially with the girls because they're not as strong as swimmers. So we're in the water. And I'm like, you know, it's pretty murky. Like, I really can't see, like, there's a lot of silt in the water, like inlet, like close to shore. And I'm like, but it's fun. And we're playing. And then I'm looking at the lifeguard tower. And I can see they just have like a row of signs up that are like what they'll put out, you know, if there's danger. And so none of those signs were out. But it's disconcerting when one of those signs is a giant crocodile. And I'm like, you know, like, I wouldn't obviously get in the water with the sign being a giant crocodile. But then I was like, you know, they have to see it and then be like, ah, right. the giant crocodile. And this could be right. the day they're like, well, there's the giant crocodile. What if, what if you're the one who alerts them to the crocodile? <laughs> exactly. That did, that has weighed on my mind since. <laughs> <laughs> so, and in like normal Australian fashion, everyone's like, eh, it's fine. Like, don't worry about it. But I'm like, look, I like rules. And we went to Australia Zoo, which is like the Irwin Zoo that like oh, Steve Irwin found yes. it, like his dad founded and he worked at. And they, you know, gave some croc lessons during like the big crocodile show. And so my youngest has been like very much like, okay, I feel so protected. And they're like, the rules are don't get in the water in crocodile country. Don't like hang on low hanging branches like over a river in crocodile country and stay six feet away from the water's edge in crocodile country. And I'm like, cool, let's go swimming all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, like we're in the open ocean. Yes, it's much like we're not jumping in a crocodile infested river. However, ugh, I'm like still thinking about it. And then also like there's fishing. I was like, oh, it'd be kind of fun to go fishing on this dock. And they're like, yeah, here's all the fish you can catch. Like on the sign, there's like, you know, all these tropical fish at the pier. And I'm like, oh, this looks kind of fun. Maybe we should go fishing. And then it's like, and just remember you're in crocodile country. So stay two meters back from the edge. And I'm like, this, that's six feet. And I'm like, but this dock is how do you, like, how do you fish? Four feet wide. <laughs> so it's like come catch all this delicious stuff and then just as the disclaimer we put on all things just remember and i was like it does put a little damper just a little yeah just (laughs) and like we went on this amazing cable car ride over the rainforest because this is the oldest tropical rainforest in the world it's part of the old gondwana land so like originally all the continents were pangea and then as they broke off gondwana became like the southern continent and so this is kind of like remnant gondwana rainforest and so yeah it's the the oldest you know continuously existing tropical rainforest in the world and it's awesome and so we're like going over the canopy looking down it's like oh the tropic and i'm such a buzzkill because i'm like there are probably like a billion snakes per like square meter that i'm looking (laughs) down into right now especially yeah this is australia where everything's trying to kill you (laughs) yes and you know what i will say that like in the past like because i bet i don't know why but there's certain snakes that have scared me more than others and one is the taipan and the Taipan, my family lives in Victoria, so I'll be in Victoria. And I'm like, well, you know, there's no Taipan down here, so we're fine. That's like the ornery, aggressive snake. And now I'm like, oh, the Taipan's like the sugarcane snake. 
look at all the sugar cane everywhere around me. So I'm like, ooh, the Taipan. So anyway, I'm having a great time. And I'm just constantly, like, in the back of my mind thinking about, you know, snakes Cracks and crocodiles. And However, you know, I'm also like, yeah, it doesn't seem like that's happening to many people. Oh, and the jellyfish. Let's get oh, <laughs> the jellyfish. Like, they freak me the out. Vin- there's the vinegar everywhere, the lifeguard thing. And so we're not in jellyfish season. Certainly we could get a vagrant, but this is not the time. The jellyfish apparently come during their summer, which sounds like a big bummer because it's like hot. And then it's like, don't go in the water because the jellyfish are everywhere. I have this like massive fear of Portuguese man o' war jellyfish. And like, I've never been in like the water where they're even like native <laughs> i'm like terrified of getting stung by one of these things i think i've seen too many do- nature documentaries or something yeah i was looking at a video of the or uh, like i was looking at a map not a video of like where because also the lifeguard station you know after you've looked at the crop you know signs <laughs> they also have like you know a thing of all the different jellyfish i should take a picture and put it on the instagram yes it's all the different jellyfish where they're kind of typically found and then what they're going to do to you. And that is a relaxing Great. experience. Okay. Because I'm like, okay, well the ones here are going to like make me vomit and like maybe have like some mild paralysis, but it doesn't look like it's going to stop my breathing. So that seems okay. Whereas the Portuguese man of war, definitely a little more alarming. Right. They terrify me. So I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack for a second for saying it sounds lovely where you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to take that back. And I'm going to be like, I'm I'm good that I'm here in the Chicago suburbs. Where <laughs> thing, it's so weird because it's like, I'm like, I guess this is just like how you live your life sometime. And, you know, I don't know why, like, I've been in bear country. I've lived in bear country. But bears just feel very reasonable to me compared to a crocodile. Saltwater crocodiles don't feel reasonable to me. I mean, I'm sure they are, and I don't know enough. I need to talk to the Irwins more. But to me, I think that they're just like, nope, nope. Kill, kill, (laughs) eat. Nope. So, I mean, I've lived in bear country my whole life. So, because I've lived in Pennsylvania. And I think, like, for us, there's, like, very set way. I mean, bear attacks will happen, so don't get me wrong. But, like, there's very set things you can do. You know what I mean? You You take your bear maze, your... You you know what to do. You don't run. Try to scare it. You know, there's like tactics that I think we all like know that makes it seem a little less scary. But like, I feel like a crocodile. That thing's hunting you down. It's hunting you down. Like, I just don't. <laughs> I don't think trying to make yourself look bigger is gonna. It's not gonna give. No, a there's shit. not much of any. Yeah, and no. what's even more funny is they didn't really give you any tips on what to do if attack. Whereas like they'll give you tips on what to do if you're like you know right. encountering like a mountain lion or a bear. None of that. They're just like just don't do it. Right, right. Just cool don't stuff. get attacked. Yeah, like, just, and then if you, you get attacked, I guess you're like, well, that's it for me. I don't know. No, I saw that somebody <laughs> said that they, oh, God, I was, <laughs> I made the mistake of being like, well, I just want to read about some crocodile attacks just to see, just to be like that person. And the one guy was like, look, when it bit me on the top of my head, I knew immediately what it was. But then I pried its jaws off, got out of the water, and they're like, and my, you know, the skull's very uh, sturdy. So, like, if it had bitten, like, my neck, I would have been in trouble with my skull. Nary a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, like, the skin covering your skull is just, like, ripped. This is a flap hanging down. <laughs> Who has, like, the wherewithal when your head is in a crocodile's mouth to be like, I'm just going to pry its jaws open and walk yeah, away. Australians do. I'm yeah. telling you. They're yeah. Like, Australians have to. <laughs> I, d- I mean, I think I've mentioned before that even like down south, like there's still like poisonous snakes everywhere. And so like I've been on like bike rides with friends and they're like telling all the kids, just look for wiggly sticks. I'm like, oh, that wiggly stick, that's the second most venomous snake in the world. Right. Like around us, we take we take hikes. And like when we see a wiggly stick, we get excited because it's nine times out of ten, it's a garter snake. And right. they're, that's all we got here. Yeah, they're harmless. So it's kind of fun. But I that- did think of you, Megan, at the Australia Zoo because their reptile exhibit, apparently you and uh, little baby Bob or Robert Irwin would have a lot in common because he's a big reptile aficionado, oh. like Steve Irwin's son. Yeah, and they've got this very curated uh, reptile exhibit. It made me think of you because it was like every snake. I would love that. I would love that. We were on a hike actually, and my son was like, he started yelling, "There's a snake! There's a snake!" And he like turned around and looked at me, and I knew he was like trying to scare me. And I just look at him and I go, 
you know that that doesn't scare me. Like, if you say there's a snake, I'm going to, like, run towards it. Like, I want to see a wild snake. And Dane's like, oh. You're like, Dane, do you know that one of my bucket list dreams is to write about a snake shop <laughs> A snake <owner>? hero. <laughs> right. I have, like, a whole, like, snake owner hero, <laughs> oh, like, God. book plotted. And so, clearly... <laughs> When Megan, like, brought this up to us as, like, her, you know, her critique partners years ago, and she's like, what do you think of this hero? And we're like, no. (laughs) You guys are like, Megan. Because I was like, he's going to have, like, tons of snakes in his house. And they're like, Megan! I feel like it would be, like, it would maybe appeal to the Duck Dynasty crowd. Right. Right. And now (laughs) there's, like, aliens that are are half snake. uh, Alien romance heroes that are half snake. So there you right, go. So you're pretty much doing it already. Yeah. You just so got to bring it back snake, to Is it the top half or bottom half? Usually it's like the bottom half. So the top half is like, sometimes they have almost like the, like the, like the cobra type, like uh, mm-hmm. wide like, head, but like f- human sort of facial features, like the eyes and the nose and a mouth, but then, and, they're, then, they're and, then and then around? arms. Well, then I think his like lower half slithers, like he might not have feet, but he can be oh, upright. Oh, like so you cobra. didn't you didn't write this? Character. No, I didn't write okay. this. There's like other there's other authors who have written snake heroes. Someone wrote a spider hero, and he and and he ties her up in his web like BDSM style. Like that's like it's like, you know. Okay, that's kind of hot. Yeah. <laughs> no, it and is then not. does he have like a big uh, pokey venomous thing that's like jabbing at her? <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, I do have a big pokey thing. Like, <laughs> <at you." laughs> uh okay well with um, that wants to make a, let's a get transition. to some heroes that I, let's get to some heroes that i do want to talk about yeah <laughs> and like, not no. not snake and spider heroes i don't think any of the heroes we're going to mention today own a snake or right? are a snake these are heroes that we would like to puncture us <laughs> <laughs> but how come they don't bite like, my skull <laughs> I need the Amy panic button, like, right now. <laughs> that could be the new linchpin. Can they bite your skull? <laughs> Will and I allow them to bite my skull? Will I pry their jaws off? <laughs> no, I'd let them just gnaw on me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you okay. guys want to finish this? <laughs> yes. I'm going to... Good night. <laughs> All right, so, pivoting to... Uh, Jane Austen now, (laughs) as one does. (laughs) Look, the cold and emotionally distant type has been one of the most popular romance tropes since Mr. Darcy met Elizabeth Bennet at the ball in Pride and Prejudice. So these folks, mainly men, have a standoffish aura that eventually thaws, leaving them a puddle for the person they love. And romance fans can't get enough. Sundere is a Japanese term for a character archetype that depicts a person with a personality who is initially frigid on the outside before gradually showing a warmer side over time. The word is most commonly found within like manga and anime, and it comes from the terms sun sun, which means to turn away in disgust and anger, and dere dere, to become affectionate. Okay. There are a number of dere types, and most deal with how a character reacts to becoming love struck. Here are just a few other types of Dere characters that can also turn up in K-dramas. Yandere, an archetype used to define a character whose love, admiration, and devotion is so strong that it is expressed as an excessive obsession and possessiveness. They are often seen as characters that are crazy in love with someone. Dere, Dere. These characters are usually very sweet and energetic. They are seen most of the time in a cheerful and happy mood, and they tend to spread joyfulness to the ones around them. No matter what may happen, they quickly revert to their cheerful self. And then there's Dandere, a character who's shy, quiet, timid, and asocial. So these characters might be, you know, nervous to talk, you know, unsure of if what something they say is going to get them into trouble. They're normally quiet and silent, and they can even come across looking emotionless at times. However, when they're alone with the right person, they can get really talkative and be very comfortable and pour their heart out. So basically, we just see that they're shy. So there's quite a few more archetypes. These are just a couple of examples. But I thought this was kind of good enough to get us going for purposes of the podcast. So could you name a K-drama character who sort of embodies one of these archetypes? So I kind of went with all of them, I think. (laughs) Because this was fun. So Yandere, the ones like crazy in love, was the first one that I thought of. And that made me think of what's wrong with Secretary Kim? I mean, We've got uh, Lee June, the amazing Parks of June, 
has his secretary, Kim Miso, the lovely Park Min Young, fill out a questionnaire under the guise of it being for work or work related when really it is so he can get to know every little thing about her so that he can plan dates for her that cater like to her every whim. Dere Dere was a tough one, but I'm going to go with Kim Sun Ho as Dushik in Hometown Cha Cha Cha. Even though his Dere Dere persona, which is like, you know, always happy, puts everyone in a good mood, it was really a mask that hit a lot of grief and guilt that he was going through. But he was still this cheerful, wonderful man who made everybody else smile for most of the drama. And then finally, Sundere, I feel, is our Mr. Darcy type. And for me, that's Hyun Bin as Captain Ri in Crash Landing on You. And I realize I focused mainly on heroes here, so I want to give out an honorable mention to... Park Jinju as the ultimate Dere Dere in almost everything I've seen her in so far, but particularly her private life and Our Beloved Summer. Someone please make her a romantic lead. So I just picked one, but um, I know I didn't I follow with, the rules. Uh, <laughs> Dere Dere. And first one that popped in my mind was Duck Sun from Reply 1988. I felt like, you know, she was kind of just like innately cheerful, not like toxically optimistic. But, you know, while she didn't bring joy necessarily to her sister or to her parents who were stressed by her kind of being a slacker, I felt like within her friend group, she really was the character that was cheerful and happy. And that was one of the reasons why that gang of boys kind of always like revolved around her was because she was just such a happy and lovable person and really just sweet to her core. Dere Dere, I'm going to go with Chue Jun Woong from Tomorrow, played by Ro Woon. He is just, he makes everyone happy around them. He is charming, he's sweet, and he's full of energy like a puppy. So even though this drama is a tearjerker, like a lot, <laughs> Jun Woong is still full of hope and he just wants to make everyone smile. And I just got to like an episode where his boss hurts his feelings and he even says, he's like, you didn't have to hurt my feelings. And he kind of pouts, but he still doesn't really take it personally. And he still like turns around and he just tries to help improve her mood because he just wants everyone around him to be happy. And he's just a super likable guy. He's just really a delight of a character. I wonder just if this is like now his thing, because in King's Affection, same. Really? That was exactly the role he plays in King's Affection. I'm down if that's if he's going to be like typecast only because he's so good at that character. He's such a joy. He really so is. So likable. I, I adore him. And then I did want to say for Dandere, it reminded me a lot of Yumi from Yumi Cells, at least in the first season. Yeah, no, I think it's very, that was a good one. I wouldn't necessarily say, yeah, I, I mean, she is a little, I would say maybe not timid, but she's definitely shy, quiet, a little antisocial, and she really doesn't seem to want to offend anyone or say something that's going to upset people. So she just kind of keeps quiet a lot. So sometimes Sundares are embarrassed by or don't know what to do about all those romantic feelings bubbling away inside. And so as a result, they might tend to get more stoic and standoffish, or even sometimes become a little bit belligerent when they're in proximity to the object of their affections. And their constant inner struggle seems to be like a lot of times between their pride and love. And that is like kind of key to why the characters act the way they do. So as Sundari characters develop, and I apologize the just because this is going to get picked up on recording. I also live in the pathway or I'm currently staying in the pathway to the Cairns airport. So if you hear uh, planes flying overhead, just give a wave to like Qantas Airlines or whoever's <laughs> making a landing today. So as Sundari characters develop and accept their feelings, they'll often remain in Sun mood in public, but then become more and more in like Dairy mode when in private. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my so, favorite part about that character. I know. Type. Yes. So Amy, given that you are a walking pop culture dictionary, <laughs> who is a Western hero that embodies the Sundari archetype? And does that character resonate with you? So you mean other than Matthew McFadden or Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy? Okay, because I love them both. So let me preface this by saying that, yes, I love the Darcy type. The aloof, standoffish hero who seems like an asshole but is really just kind of shy sometimes. He doesn't know how to open up until he unexpectedly falls ass over elbow, but it's not an easy road since those lovey-dovey feels often don't know how to be expressed, so they come out all wrong. It's so like you were saying, like can kind of get belligerent and stuff like that. So I'm going to go back to one of my favorite TV romance heroes, who is full Sundere frigid as fuck until he melts into a pile of goo for the right woman. And when I say frigid, I mean the undead type of frigid. <laughs> the I subsist on human blood kind of frigid, because I'm talking about Damon Salvatore from The Vampire Diaries. <laughs> Megan, did you watch Vampire Diaries? No. 
Ugh. but I but I like am familiar with the character of Damon. So that's a good one, right? Damon that's a good is one. So good. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't seen Vampire Diaries, I'm going to spoil some shit for you. And I don't care because it's been over for years. But it's a fantastic series based on the book series by L.J. Smith. So Damon Salvatore is played to perfection by Ian Somerhalder. And if you haven't watched it, Damon is one of the two Salvatore brothers, the other being Stefan, who are the focus of a long standing love triangle. The series does a really great job of introducing Stefan as the ultimate hero type in the beginning, you think. He's a vampire, but he only feeds on animals. He's sweet and thoughtful, only showing his violent side when his quote-unquote evil brother Damon shows up with the sole purpose of ruining his life. Damon is the worst, a ruthless murderer, it seems. You'd never imagine him the hero, but oh, how things change when the layers are peeled back. Damon's love for Elena, who is our, our heroine in the series, ultimately turns him into more of a hero than Stefan ever was. And yes, I will die on the sword if you are Team Stefan. And I will forever love this character. Come to think of it, another similar one is Alexander Skarsgård as Sheriff Eric Northman from True Blood. So I guess I like my Sundares on the undead side. Yeah, but a good tortured paranormal hero, there's like nothing like it. It's my favorite. It right? really, I mean, hello, Goblin is my, right. my favorite cave drama, right? But Damon is the one who, like, when he shows up, you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy is the worst. Like, Stefan's our hero. No. No. That's, and the that's paranormal it. element's good because they can be tortured for, like, centuries. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like and Goblin. you're usually catching them after, like, you know, at least decade, a good few yeah. decades. Yeah. Right. So, Megan, we often talk about universal fantasies on the podcast, and this is a concept that author T. Taylor describes as, you know, the butter or the key ingredient that makes a romantic story extra delicious. So what is it about this type of hero that is yummy? <laughs> and yes, I said yummy. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, speaking of universal fantasies, a common universal fantasy is that, you know, we want to feel special. So the butter of being loved by a Sundare character is that while they are stoic to everyone else, for you, they are a marshmallow. For you, they make up exceptions. So in Crash Landing on You, Sari gives Captain Ri a finger heart. And when he finds out that she gave the other North Korean soldiers a finger heart, he pouted. Because even Captain Ri wants to f the butter of feeling special. I love that. Oh my gosh. I picture him in his bed, in his, you know, in his army fatigues, just... Yeah, because he wants, he wants that, he wants to feel special. He wants the only one. So, I mean, that would be like a universal fantasy that like, you're the one who gets a finger heart from like someone who doesn't give a finger heart to anyone else. Right. And the only one. Yes. <laughs> yes. So Leah, have you written any Sundare characters that you want to talk about? Because this is a very catnip character for you. Yeah, so I will say that um, my second hero that I ever wrote was a Sundere, and I've done a few others since then, but I'm going to talk about this hero today. Um, and I say second hero because my first hero I wrote is just not even a character. That was the first book I ever wrote, and <laughs> that book is a hot mess. So this, <laughs> this character that I'm talking about now, this is my first book that was published, the second book I ever read. And so what I kind of like was going for with this is I have always had, and you know, as I've gotten a little older and wiser, I'm going to like say I've kind of fallen away from slightly, but we'll never quite get over the Mr. Rochester archetype. So, you know, we have Mr. Darcy, who is aloof and uptight and really kind of like portrays, I think, well, the Sundari character. Mr. Rochester adds just like an element of um, kind of toxicity within that, which I think has, you know, because when somebody becomes like, when you're the person chosen by the love interest, like by the hero or heroine that has this character, you know, you're special, you're not like the other girls, you're not or the boys or whatever. And then there's this little bit of like the asshole with the heart of gold. So I'd say that's kind of like, I think Sundaries can kind of have that too, like, or yes. Sundaries, like that asshole to talk. And we can see it done to where there's like the alpha and then the alpha hole. We've talked before yeah. about the alpha hole, the aura true alpha. So given that my second book ended up being my third and fourth as well. I was able to do a trilogy. And what I wanted to kind of do with it was kind of show how you could take a character that is more like an alpha hole and kind of 
have it be like their journey to becoming like a true alpha. So at the beginning, they're kind of more like the bad boy and they're cold to everyone and they've been hurt and they're only going to like the heroine. And I kind of wanted to do like what would happen if like, yeah, Mr. Rochester kind of like came into like the 21st century, got called on some of his toxic bullshit. We're going to like avoid the wife in the attic and the racism that he embodies in Jane Eyre. Like (laughs) that's a whole other situation. But we're just talking about like the archetype of the character. And then has to do some personal growth and sacrifice and kind of at the end become much more of like a true alpha who would have the fanny pack of snacks for like the crew. And so, yeah, I really, really like this character type. Sometimes I like it when it's problematic too. You know, it's just, it is what it is. There's just something about this one that has just always worked for me. I mean, I was raised reading old school romance. I think it just got in my brain that I do. I like that, that icy front marshmallow on the inside. And what is the name of the character oh, right. that you wrote? <laughs> so <laughs> talk yourself up here. Yeah. Okay. So the character that is um, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> Bran Lockhart. But Amy, I don't know if you're laughing because you remember what I was originally going to name him. <laughs> so oh my not, gosh. Like, okay. So here's a se- <laughs> just like a slight segue. So this series is called Off the Map. Uh, the first book is Upside Down, then they're Sideswiped, and then Inside Out are the three books. And in it is this hero, um, Bran Lockhart, uh, disenfranchised, of course, very rich, like Australian, moody bad boy. And- I love him. I love Bran. <laughs> And so the other thing that's funny, because I mean, some of you are writers that listen, some of you are just kind of interested in how the sausage is made in books. There's a lot of times when I don't end up going with the hero's name that I like have as my working title. And I think that's interesting. So like sometimes like halfway through the book, like all of a sudden I'll be like, you know what, this really just is not your name. And this is your name. And then I have to like go back and change it. In this case, I think it was probably one of the more fortuitous uh, name changes, (laughs) because my character Bran Lockhart's like, what a what a romance name name. that is yeah Yeah. he was dylan baxter (laughs) oh no (laughs) who sounds like he's gonna do your taxes (laughs) dylan baxter (laughs) i know and amy just always thought that was so funny that brand i don't think you ever told me that that's hysterical (laughs) thank god you went with brand law yeah like well oh my god the first book i'm like this dude just is not talking to me right and i'm like it's because you named really him Dylan. Dylan. Right, it's because you called him Dylan Baxter, and he's like waiting for your receipts. <laughs> <laughs> and then once I got the name, I tell you, the voice started talking to me. So um, yeah, that's a side piece of writer magic. And I don't know if that's ever happened to either of you where like, you know, you haven't felt like you've gotten the name right and you've had to go change it. Just this yes. is a non sequitur, oh. but I think it's interesting. Absolutely. I've changed names midway through the book or... Or I've realized midway through the book that I've called a character by two different names because I was kind of waffling back and forth. And so then I have to pick, like, because I've, I've been calling them two different things. So names are really, names are tough. I like troll baby naming websites way more now than I did when I was trying to name my babies. Yeah. Well, I, I think my, I, I'm okay. I, I usually do pretty well with names. I, my biggest issue is, of course, I write alien romance and it's naming the alien species, like all the different species. So like right now I'm in the current book I'm writing, I introduce sort of like a, like an human lion like species and I'm still undecided. Do they have manes? Yeah, like they have manes. <laughs> they have kind of like a muzzle, like a lion face, you know, like Mufasa. She actually, the heroine actually is like, he, he's like a, you know. She's going to get on down. With like a, like a <laughs> bipedal. Uh, <you> <laughs> yeah. She says he's like a bipedal Mufasa. So anyway, I'm really struggling with what to name these lion things. I just, I don't know. I have a name right now and I don't like it. So I'm probably going to change it. But that's, yeah, that's my struggle right now is I don't know what to name. How do you name lion characters and not want to just use all the names for the lion? Right. Like like that would be the only thing I could think of. Yeah. I think (laughs) I named him, I forget what I named the actual like king, but I, but my, um, I'm okay with his name as king. It's what the species, I just don't know what to name them as a species. Like, what do you name a lion? (laughs) I don't know, like a bipedal lion species. I don't know. I don't know. I'll figure it out. But that's what I'm struggling with right now when it comes to names. And if anyone does have any genius ideas, let yeah. us know at you got like a Duna Delight podcast. Please. At gmail.com or on our Instagram. <laughs> Megan could use a name. Lion <laughs> yeah, species. Name my lion species. Naming. Yeah, why are we doing this as a... <laughs> 
<laughs> Name the lion species. <laughs> Do they roar loudly as they mate? Do they bite the neck? They well, have to bite the neck. They're a side character right now, but if uh, my readers like them, then I'll turn them into like heroes and then yeah then i gotta then i gotta do a whole mating thing i it's a whole it'll be all they have tails the i just keep thinking of like, like the, the feline corkscrew yeah or like the Wiener. scaredy what's the lion in the wizard of oz what's the cowardly lion yeah the cowardly lion where he's always like he's always like petting his little like tufted tail oh my jesus <laughs> in his lion onesie because <laughs> okay I'm hitting the button right now. I'm the one hitting the button because even Amy has gone off the rails on this. Okay. So a a big disclaimer for the podcast is that, you know, we do err on the side of, you know, being thirsty. And I think that it's safe to say that all of us have a thing for a good male Sundari. But a good Sundari character can also totally be a woman or, you know, a non-binary person. So in terms of K-drama, who is a character who is not a male who comes to mind? So I mentioned Park Jin-ju before, but I'll add Ko Moon-young, played by uh, So Ye-ji from It's Okay to Not Be Okay, as a big time Sundari. And Gong Hyo Jin as Dong Baek from When the Camellia Blooms as a Dondere who blooms as the drama goes on and really comes into her own as a strong personality by the end. But for much of the drama, she's very timid, very shy, very sort of like afraid to speak. Mm. Yeah, that's a good example of a Dondere for sure. And then the first one that popped up to mind for me was actually, I couldn't remember her name, so I had to look it up. It's, and forgive me if I've got this wrong, but it's Taluipa. So Taluipa played by Kim Jong-nan, who is from Tale of the Nine-Tailed, and that is the agent of the Afterlife Immigration Office and the guardian of the Samdo River. She was amazing. And she's very aloof and brusque on the surface and just you know does not give a lot away emotionally but as the drama goes you see she's quite a marshmallow for Lee Yun in particular and you know she's had some reasons and she's had some trauma for why she has this mask up but I do I did think that like yeah she just really like kind of like fit that personality really well that's a really good good example and then you know given that do you think that female sundari characters are treated differently by k-drama watchers or romance readers like the actual sundari type you know the the frigid on the outside yes i do think that there is a double standard against female characters who are like this like we you know tend to find it and i say like the collective we like i'm not you know saying me or pointing my fingers at anybody you know in particular but we tend to see more criticism for a woman who is like that than for a man. Like some readers or viewers will let men get away with being total, you know, assholes or alpha holes if they are sexy enough and do something to redeem their bad behavior. Whereas when female characters are like this, they're just often painted as being a bitch. And it's both men and women who, you know, judge these characters as such. So I'm not, you know, saying that it's just romance readers or, you know, K-drama watchers. But, you know, like even, you know, in real life people, I feel like women tend to get criticized for having a strong personality. And then they get criticized if they're being too emotional. So I feel like as a woman, whether it's a character in a K-drama or a romance, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it's a really sort of, you know, high wire to balance to have readers often accept your character if they're not going to be, you know, all sunshine and rainbows. Yeah, Ko Moon Young from It's Okay Not to Be Okay gets a lot of heat for being cold. But I loved her. And she really was a total mush once she opened up to Gang Tae. It's just interesting. She... I say this about my husband a lot, that he is like a very, very small bubble of people he cares about. And like, if you're not in that bubble, like he doesn't, he, I'm sorry, he just like doesn't, he doesn't care. And Ko Moon Young reminds me of that. Like she has a very small bubble and she cares fiercely about the people that are in that bubble. But if you're not in it, then she doesn't really like have, she doesn't have a lot of empathy for you. And, you know, I feel like, yeah, a a male character that would present as like, Sundere or stoic or kind of sexy but for ko moon young it presented as like bitchy or cold or whatever yeah i feel like that asshole with a heart of gold is a universal fantasy that's allowed to male characters but yeah if you're 
not male and you're cold, then God help you. So I also think of Bo Ra from Reply 1988. Yeah. So, you know, nobody, and when you watch it, like, you're not really meant to like Bo Ra at the start. Like, she doesn't do much to endear love. But I think she would have gotten a bigger hall pass out of the gate if she was a dude. Because she's also yes. a really great Sundari character. Yeah, and she we see is. That she really has, like, that marshmallow center. But I think if she was a guy at the beginning, you'd be like, oh, he's so, like angry all the time and short tempered but like eh, it's kind of hot too because he's also like super smart and like top of his class and going to like student riots and fighting the good cause i mean it sounds like the hero i wrote and i'm saying down honestly right but being that it's this you know female character and that her sister is so like loving and sweet and funny and easygoing it really just like also highlights like god she's just such a bitch right you know, their their setup is good foils to each other, Duxan and Bo Ra, but it hurts Bo Ra, sadly, because everybody's like, why aren't you more like her? You know, kind of thing. Where Yeah. It's funny. I mean, she's more successful, but yeah, everyone's right. saying like personality wise. Right. Like, yeah. I'm glad that I saw that drama and that I know that character because I love that character. And she's such a great example of, and, and same thing with Moon Young, like, you have your people that you are close to and that you love and you'll do anything to protect them. But if you don't act that way towards everybody, then you're judged for mm-hmm. it. Yeah, that was a really good example. I forgot about um, her. And she was one of my favorite yeah. characters in that drama. All right. Well, now it's time for our favorite part of every episode. And that's our K wreck of the week. So we are back to Megan giving a wreck. And what do you have for us? I am so excited about this wreck. I've been watching this song on YouTube, all their performances nonstop. So the song is hashtag mood. M O O D, and it's by the group M C N D. It is so fun. It's kind of like this, like perfect, like summer bop. And what I love about it is there's like, there's even like a line that's like, make it fun. Like, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, well, you did. It's fun as hell. The choreography is like really intense, but it's also just like joyful. And the leader of MCND, his name is Castle J. Um, He wrote and produced this song, which always like endears me more towards a song and a K-pop group. He's just really talented. And I think the song is doing well. And I'm proud of them because it's just it's just so much fun. So much fun. All their performances are just so high energy. So yeah, check it out. It's called Hashtag Mood. And it is by MCND. If you enjoy our podcast, you have our patrons to thank, at least in part. Afternoon of Delight Patreon allows us to keep creating content for y'all to enjoy. Thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us there. And not to brag, but our Patreon community is pretty awesome. And you can join at a tier that feels good to you. Gain access to fun perks like K-drama posts, monthly Patreon-only bonus podcasts, and even a live K-drama support group on Zoom. Because we know firsthand what it's like to have no one to talk to about those crazy plot twists, amazing characters, and all those feelings. And look, no one should have to walk that walk alone. So learn more by visiting afternoonadelight.com. That's www.afternoonadelight.com. And hey, while you're on the website, you can check out Afternoon A Delight podcast merch, find links to book recommendations, bop along to our K-pop recs, Blow up your skin with K Merch Rex. Find all of our social media and a link to our email so you can send us recommendations or feedback. And hey, while you're at it, why don't you pop over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five star review? It really helps with our discoverability. Gamsamnida. So when I say Sundere, which K drama hero immediately comes to mind? Talk us through this hero, give a little setup to the drama, and how does the Sundere personality help contribute to a satisfying romance or love story? And just as an aside, I want to point out for anyone newer to the pod that romance by definition guarantees an HEA for the main leads, whereas a love story can have more of a bittersweet or even sad ending for the couple, aka the notebook being more of a love story than a romance. Okay, so Leah did not say that there was a moratorium on talking about crash landing on you, so I took it. So for me, when I first hear of this character, it all goes back to Captain Ri Jong Hyuk from Crash Landing on You. So ear muff it if you don't want spoilers, if you haven't seen Crash Landing on You yet, because I'm going to talk about the wonderfully romantic stuff that he ends up doing for our heroine. He's the first that comes to mind every time I think of this archetype as someone who embodies it so well, because when we meet him, I mean... 
first of all, okay, she is a South Korean who has literally crash landed <laughs> paragliding into North Korea, which for for that, I mean, I just have to say for like that being my first K drama, and I'm watching the first episode, and I'm messaging with Leah and our other friend Chanel, who were already watching it, and I'm like, did she really just get stuck in a tornado on a par- you know paragliding, and she's okay? And they're like, just go with it, just go with it, and you you do have to go with it. But anyway, she crashes into North Korea. She's South Korean. He thinks that she's a spy. Like, obviously, he's going to be extremely standoffish and cold. But then for reasons we don't know, he ends up protecting her rather than turning her in. And in order to do so, she has to stay at his place. And now he's gotten in so deep that he has to, you know, protect himself to not get caught. So, you know, they have to spend more time together. And obviously, our, you know, cold, frigid captain ends up melting. So he keeps Suri at a distance for eight, eight episodes, folks. It's excruciating, but like deliciously so, because then we get the payoff when things start happening midway through. Like he takes a bullet for her, (laughs) crawls through the tunnel of love for her, pre-writes a year's worth of texts for her. Like, I still can't get over all of the things that he does when she and the audience are unaware of it that just show us how much he is a complete and utter marshmallow for her. And I think that was probably when I realized that an alpha hero didn't have to be an alpha. Yes. Yay. Captain Sri would have a fanny pack of crackers for his entire team. He would have band-aids. He'd carry the pack of supplies for everyone. He's always prepared. Always He's prepared. like, yeah, He's I mean. the freaking best. He is. So for me, I mean, if you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time, actually, I mentioned two because, you know, it's my podcast, whatever. Or it's our podcast. I can do what I want. But yeah, so first I'm going to say healer. And he, I mean, he's such an... What? You're going to say healer? <laughs> he's such an exaggerated, over-the-top t- uh, sundere that is just totally my favorite. I mean, if you want to know my perfect like male lead, it's, basi- it's basically healer. So Ji Chang Wook plays an emotionally closed off errand boy who lives in like a barren warehouse and has major abandonment issues. He doesn't let anyone close, has no relationships with any family, and he has like no friends. <laughs> he's this badass fighter and he's skilled at parkour, but when he's alone in his like <laughs> you know, sad warehouse. He's just in like sweatpants and he's like shuffling around in his slides, heating up his ramen in a microwave as he watches nature shows. Like, oh, (laughs) I love him. So (laughs) this makes the romance incredibly satisfying because we see as the heroine, Shae Young Shin, played by Park Min Young, slowly break down all his walls until he finally lets her in. And when he does, he's like this happy, clingy, puppy. I mean, he completely melts inside. He's so in love and it's so sappy and so happy. So it just makes the romance like extra, extra satisfying because his character growth and his arc is so complete. And look, I'm sorry, but I have to give an honorable mention to Kim Min-Q from I'm Not a Robot. It's no surprise that both of these dramas are like in the top two of of my favorite dramas. Kim Min-Q is also just such a great Sundaray character. He's shut off from everyone and everything and even has this like, you know, great plot device of a touch allergy, which prevents any sort of romance. You know, he starts the drama dressed in black, he carries a frickin baton to keep everyone away from him. His employees think he's an asshole. In fact, they call him baton behind his back. So when he finally, you know, lets himself trust and he falls for the heroine, it really does make this romance that much more special. Um, Because it's not just the romance, it's also like the, the character arc of the, of the Sundaray character. So, you know, plus Ming, Kim Min Q in love is just the best. Like Healer, he's just mushy and cuddly, and he even does egg yo. I just love him. But we do get to see him be mushy before he falls in love, because we get to see him be a marshmallow for his For vacuum. his vacuum, correct. But not for humans. <laughs> so she's no, the special him. human. <laughs> but he thinks she's right. a robot. The lovely. Okay, just both of your heroes, both of your heroes are the exact same guy. You realize Me? that, right? Like, just isolated from the oh, world. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's isolated what I'm saying. From- <laughs> if, like, it, that's what I'm saying. It, like, clearly I have a type. They're, like, the exact same. Right. It's why those two are, you know, my top in romance. And also why Crash Landing on You is my top. Like, those are my favorite because 
uh, yeah, the Sundari character is is everything to me. It's a great kind of hero. And yeah. I think the ones that I'm sharing. So first, let me just give another apology, because not only am I in the path of a airport, there's somebody doing yard work <laughs> nearby. Oh, my God, I can hear <laughs> um, you didn't and explain so, yeah, your window, window situation. situation just really quickly. Someone's like cutting down a yeah. tree. So I'm in the tropics <laughs> and and this means that there's no windows here. I mean, there's windows, like there's holes in the walls with light coming through, but they're kind of like there's grates over them so that people, I guess, can't like jump through the window. But then there's just like slats that come down, like very thin wooden slats. So it really doesn't cut out any noise. So I'm sitting here and you know what? You're just going to have to hear what I hear. And that's just how it is. There's no soundproof podcast room (laughs) happening on this trip in the jungle. (laughs) Sounds like someone's like, (laughs) it's like like meat grinder outside. Yeah, it sounds like Fargo, the end of Fargo. (laughs) (laughs) It's a wood chipper. No, it's not that. I am literally on the end of the jungle. Somebody in the neighborhood is trying to hold back the jungle. So just let it happen, I guess. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So yeah, I feel like I also have a type, but my type, tends to have a little bit more assholeness happening to it. Yeah, totally. That's that we know this. Yes. So <laughs> I'm going to go with my first choice is a drama that you have not watched. But I in the last week binge watched this entire thing. God help me again, which is Moon Lovers, Scarlet Heart, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go with the fourth prince, Wang So, who is played by Lee Jun Gi. And if you know, you know, basically. So you haven't watched this drama. Basically, the premise is IU plays a esthetician who is sucked back in time in like a drowning accident, basically. And she comes to in a hot spring. So she falls like into the water and comes to in a hot springs in a palace in the Goryeo, the very beginning of the Goryeo dynasty, when the first Goryeo king is on the throne. The kingdoms have just been united. Everything's pretty fractious. And there's like, 14 princes and they're all in the hot springs like bathing and they're all like they're all like the heavy hitters of (laughs) K-drama shirtless and lounging and she kind of comes through like who me Um, so anyway she ends up working in the palace many princes like her and one of the main love interests is the fourth prince and he's the very mysterious prince so I mean like there's like (laughs) I know let it happen so funny. That was a person in a wood chipper. Yeah, it like sounds like was. a wood chipper. I am not living strangers from hell, I promise. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, keep going. Okay, so funny. the fourth prince literally has like a Phantom of the Opera style mask. It's like black metal, and it's covering half of his face because he has obviously a scar, and obviously it's like very sexy, and obviously he thinks it's like horrific, so he has to wear this like, you know, mask to cover it. Although, and really, we're like, show it, show yeah. it. And then IU, because she's a makeup artist in re- like modern day, comes up with like a makeup system of like BB cream to like cover it up for him so he can like remove his <laughs> mask and like hang out. Anyway, he is like, his mom hates him for kind of never any really good reason. He has been like shipped out to like learn fighting. He's known as like a savage murderer. You know, everyone's a little afraid of him. He is very stern. And then, like, with IU, he's just, like, totally, like, takes her out in, like, the rowboat on, like, a little pond and, like, you know, rows around. And, you know, he'll do anything for her. And, you know, it's Lee Jun Gi, like, giving it his all. So, really, yeah, he's a great Sundari character if you've seen Moon Lovers. And he also, like, just, like, embodies... Mm, yeah, I think that like he has a little bit of like the asshole streak kind of remains throughout. However, he's always able to kind of reconcile it by like putting her first, except when he can't for reasons of the plot, which then becomes like a lot of torment and torture for him as well. And I'm not going to say this is a HEA. This is more of a love story. <laughs> and then the other character that I wanted to bring up quickly that we've all watched this drama is Sang Chu from Semantic Error. I thought he was a great Sundari character. So he is the love interest in Semantic Error. He is a very smart programmer, very cold on the outside, does not take kindly to people shirking their duty or slacking in work, which leads him into a confrontation with his love interest. And basically we get this whole amazing, you know, boy love story of this like very sweet 
yet alpha character kind of like wearing away at his defenses and revealing the marshmallow underneath to the point that we even see that he like screenshots all of his his like love interest instagram photos and saves them to like swoon over in private i love it he's so great so you watched moon lovers again but have you finished pachinko yet no <laughs> I was staying with a friend on the Sunshine Coast, and she. I'm actually going to be putting out a snack by the time this uh, podcast is out. Um, our snack will probably be out because she has watched Descendants of the Sun ten times, and I just think that's so fascinating. And so I wanted to do like a short snack on like the idea of like rewatching a comfort drama that many times. And then while we were there, I don't know. She was like, "What else could I watch?" And I don't know how I just threw out Moon Lovers, but I did. And she could access it here because we're in Australia. And then I'm like, oh, my God, if we can access it. Oh, I was going to ask how you watched it. I was like, did you watch it on your phone with all the ads? Yeah. yeah. So I was able to finally watch it. And holy smokes, I was like, it's such a ridiculous drama. It truly is. And is it good? I don't even know. I mean, I feel like it's horrible (laughs) and excellent altogether. Like the acting's amazing. The story has so many plot holes. And I don't even care. Like I was sobbing. And it was really funny. And I think I, I... reached out to Megan on Slack because at one point, one of the princes, I'm like, God, this kid is just so cute. Like, how come he hasn't been in anything? Like, who is he? He's so adorable. And I, he's so underrated. Like, who is he? And then I Google him and he's Baekhyun from XO. So I'm like, oh, he's like right. super freaking like, famous. Super famous. And I'm like, God, this poor you know, underrated K-drama actor. <laughs> I hope he's in more things once he's out of the yard. Well, he's in the military yeah. right now. So I'm hoping Ugh. when he comes back, he does some more stuff because he is he's and he's super like, he's really charming. He's very famous, very, very, very popular. But his Korea. emotional range in his role was I mean, he had a hard role, I thought to pull off in that drama. Oh, good. Where he's meant to be very playful, but kind of young, but also kind of an idiot and also kind of arrogant. And he also has this thing where he falls in love with somebody but doesn't realize he's falling in love with them because he thinks he's in love with IU just like everyone else else and like Aww. so it's this really sweet and i think it's hard to play a character that's like falling in love but not like admitting it to themselves yeah and he does it really well and that's another catnip character i don't even know what you call that but the character who falls in love not knowing they're falling in love but that's also like a delightful that's fun character all right so who is a sundary character who has fallen flat for you i don't know if i would say he fell flat because i still love this drama. So I love my Minho, Something Fierce, and I love Boys Over Flowers with every problematic fiber of my being. But I will say that the character of Gu Jun Pyo is not so great. <clears throat> like, is is not. But I, I still love him. But he, here's, I guess here's what I'd say is the problem with him. Because, you know, when we talk about a good Sundere character is... You peel back the layers, they, you know, they have some growth, they turn into a puddle for the woman that they love, and he doesn't grow very much in this drama. There's not really much growth by anybody in this drama, <laughs> but I don't know why, I just love it so much. I feel like it, look, um, I am a weird Jumpyo stan. I think he has growth. I like him. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't love him, because I do, but I, I guess if I had to pick one... That would be one that I'd say is like lesser down on the rungs, but it doesn't keep me from loving that character or that drama. Okay, so I'm going to go with the male lead in another Miss O or like another Oh Hey Young. Or So I don't even remember his name and I'm not looking it up because that's how much I dislike him. He <laughs> And I know some people like this drama and I'm really sorry. Uh, I didn't like it. So he's supposed to be a a Sundere. He's the one who, let me just say, his character is why I didn't like this drama. I actually liked a lot of things about this drama, but his character ruined it for me. So he was supposed to be a Sundere, but instead he was just a jerk. Like, just a flat out jerk. I love when a good Sundere lashes out when he begins to start to feel, which we mentioned that earlier. Like, there's this really cool moment where she realizes that the other character is, like, getting under their skin and they, like, don't know how to react. So they get, like, a little jerky and belligerent. And he got like that, but there wasn't we basically, I th- don't think we ever got like a marshmallow center and there was never sort of anything redeeming about what he did because he wasn't just like a minor jerk. He was like a massive jerk for like, you know, 10 episodes. So, yeah, I just, he never redeemed himself. I never understood his motivations and I didn't care. I think this character really could have been something with better writing, but instead he fell flat. 
for me. And he has now passed the male lead of something about 1% who held the spot for over a year as my least liked male lead. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> oh, because yes, I will say some of our listeners have loved this. So I do feel like I need to watch it and come to my I own. actually think you might like him. I actually think you would like this drama. Truly. Actually, I was thinking that when I watched it, I'm like, Leah might like this, okay. but it's not a, it's not a drama. Well, maybe for me. I will watch it at some point in the next couple months and then we can talk about it. Yeah. And for me, I couldn't pick one, honestly. Like I gave this assignment and then I thought about it and I'm like, I don't think I have one. Like nobody came to mind. I was like, I really, it's like pizza, even Papa John's pizza. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, you know, even if, with hot dogs, yeah, with hot dogs, like I, I'm going to just like, like it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah it is an archetype that i like i will say yeah. it, it definitely is and i think i think it's the archetype that makes me give a pass to a junpyo kind of character because there's just something inherently attractive there's like there's a universal fantasy to it there's butter to it i mean so. usually for me i need like a reason for them to be so closed off so as long as that's like a good reason which clearly like healer and i am not a robot the reason that those characters were like sundaray or sun at the beginning to everyone and really standoffish like their backstory was fantastically well done to explain why they were like they were. Especially, I would say Kim Min-Q, above all, had such a fantastic backstory that made you understand why he was the way he was. So I feel like for me, as long as that's in there, I kind of don't love when it's just this like, like jerk to be a jerk, I guess, unless he unless he really has good growth. And there's like, something that breaks through. But I feel like I don't see it normally being a jerk to be a jerk. And I think this might be a whole other conversation is like, I think I think that's why I didn't like another miss out because to me, he was just a jerk to be a jerk. Okay. So I think TBD that on that. To I do really want to hear your <laughs> thoughts on that, actually. Yeah. I don't think that Amy will like it. But that's just my my thoughts. Okay. Always fun to have a controversial take and we shall now we um, I've committed to it. I will watch another miso. We can have a controversial podcast okay. and make people there's so there are a lot of things I did like. Big just so you know. Like the, the very <laughs> Yeah. The beginning was actually just see the heroine in that I loved. So just so you know. Okay. There's a lot to like about it. You know, a lot of times we'll talk about the difference between real life and drama life. And, you know, how there's, like, what we like in real life fantasy versus, like, you know, our imagination fantasy. So do you like Sundari heroes in real life as much as in dramas? I do. And, you know, initially, the way that I responded to this was, sadly, I think I'm attracted to Sundari types. And the reason why I say sadly is because I think the ones that I find are not ready to be marshmallows yet. <laughs> <laughs> Their marshmallow potential hasn't been tapped. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also think, and this is, I mean, this has been, I don't know if you call it a personality trait or a personality problem of mine, but I've always been the person who kind of likes the thrill of the chase, the uphill battle, the, you know, I'm going to be the special one that makes this person fall, you know, kind of thing. And there, I, yeah, there is a certain thrill to that, to, to being that person. Um, so I have not found my Sundari yet, but I'm I'm looking. Yeah, I do. In real life, I, I drama life and real life combine here. I like my Sundarays in dramas better than in real life. So I mean, my husband is is definitely a, a Sundari, and I you know definitely felt special when the stoic and quiet, cute guy in college opened up to me and only me. But now we've been together for over fifteen years. And it's very frustrating that we process emotions <laughs> on completely different levels. <laughs> And the fact that, like, Ko Moon Young, his empathy levels are, like, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, in in real life, in dramas, it's just, it's a lot, I don't know, it's a lot sexier and romantic. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I was thinking about it because it's funny. And no, I actually, in real life, have never really gone after this. So this is, like, my, like almost my solo like preference in like you know fictional romantic heroes and in real life no not really you know my current husband has like gone grumpier over time but i think that's just becoming like a grumpy old man but like and the face i think i've always <laughs> gone for like the dairy dairy types like i've always liked people that are kind of like cheerful and happy and fun loving and you know certainly i've liked 
like other types as well, but never somebody who's just kind of maybe my first boyfriend, actually. My very first like uh, college boyfriend was maybe a little bit more like that, but I feel like that's being generous to him. <laughs> <laughs> makes him sound more interesting yeah, it makes than he him really sound was. More interesting than he really was. I'm not gonna so no, I'm not gonna do that. But um yeah, I think um overall <laughs> No, I've tended to, to always like kind of like the like, you know, witty, funny, kind of like outgoing, extroverted, playful type. Not that like marshmallow cold type. But f- give me a fictional character that does that. And I'm like Ugh, a little puppy right? at the window with like my nose like licking the glass. Right. Adopt me. I think it's because <laughs> I mean, I think it's because in fiction, like, I mean, that's a story that we know well. I mean, that is a very common hero trope in romantic fiction. So we know where it's going to go. We know when he falls, he's going to fall so hard. And we're waiting for that payoff. And it's so funny that I just don't get tired of it. Never. Never. I mean, because there's always different situations that make it okay. But like, yeah, it's just always, always a good place to be. I never get tired of it in romantic fiction. Like, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. All right. Well, this was fun. Maybe we can do some other archetype, uh, you know, favorite discussions at some point. Yeah, this was really fun. I like this a lot because it lets us talk about a lot of different dramas and a lot of our favorite things. So do we have a book rec? Yeah. So speaking of, you know, books with great Sundere characters, I'm going to mention a series by Jennifer L. Armentrout. So it's the Dark Elements series. And I read this a long time ago, so I don't remember everything. But basically, of course, there's a good, it's young adult, and there's a good old young adult uh, love triangle between Layla, the heroine, and Zane, who is a gargoyle, I think he's a gargoyle shifter, and then Roth, who is a demon. And let me tell you right now, Roth is definitely more of like he starts out as like an alpha hole and you're not really sure if he's like good or bad but once he falls for Layla it's like all bets are off he is so cool he's got this like snake tattoo on his arm that will like slither off and become a real snake of course he's a snake tattoo yeah snake see clearly I'm like got a thing for snakes anyway he's just a really really cool character he is a little charming too and a little snarky which usually Sundarays aren't but he's still just he's he really goes hard for her and it's really special so yeah so uh, check out the Dark Elements series by Jennifer L. Arbentrout and what's everybody watching so I am I know I've been watching tomorrow for like but a you month, can right like I'm it's almost... a type of drama that just kind of takes a while because it's yeah. not a bingey drama it's not because it's really emotional. So like you'll watch an episode and you'll be like, all right, I need to take a break now. But um, I have three more episodes left. So I'll be done really soon. And I mean, I'm really I really love it. It's just that yeah, it's a tearjerker. I love it. I, I loved mean, it. yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Amy and I are going to be talking about it in a few weeks. So oh, oh, and finish Ken Porsche, which Lee and I will be discussing very soon. And I can't freaking wait next week. You're discussing it. That's awesome. Yeah. I am watching Cafe Minamdong, and it's I binged the first four episodes over the weekend, and so now I'm taking them live. So episodes five and six released um, this week, so I'm in the middle of episode five. It is another one that is, like, really funny, but also is dealing with some serious stuff. But right now, in the first four episodes, it's been mostly, like, over-the-top silliness, but in a good way. I'm really mm-hmm. enjoying it. I'm looking forward to see where it goes. There's elements of a lot of other dramas that I like in it. And um, I think that's what's keeping me going as well as the leads are awesome as well. So it, yeah, it's super fun so far. I have laughed a lot. You know, just take a, a former cop who is, you know, passing himself off as a shaman. But really, he's just a really good profiler with a hacker sister who gets him all the information he needs. And so he, I mean... He is cleaning up as a shaman, but now is involved in a three-year-old murder case that had to do with him going to prison and the heroine, and it's it's good stuff. So yeah, so I've said it once, I'll say it again. I enjoy my romances with a side of murder, so who knew? Yeah, I'm excited. I think I'm going to start that next, after I'm done tomorrow. And so, yeah, since I've seen you all, I did binge watch 20 episodes of Moon Lovers, uh... <laughs> You know, I mean, we, my friend Jack and I did it in four nights. 
And so that is five episodes a night, basically, which is like an hour and 10 minutes an episode. I mean, it was a hardcore bit. Yeah. So I'm back to Yumi Cells, which um, is getting close to wrapping up. So Yumi Cells 2. And look, I cannot... Like, Megan, you watched the first one. The second one, I'm really enjoying. I don't know if you're still going to like it, but we do have the hero from Anbo Young's character makes appearances in the second one, which is I good heard. because it's like the ex. Yeah. He's good. And the hero in this one is good. And we know that this is the this is not a spoiler. This is like the second in a three-part series. So we know that this, it's just very difficult because of the love interest in number two. I didn't think anything could replace number one. And little did I know, I had not meant Yababi. <laughs> And he is amazing and adorable. And I love him so much. So I'm really enjoying that. I will be watching Pachinko soon. So may, uh, Amy doesn't kill me. Well, because we're potting it. on it in three weeks. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'll knock that out. No problem. And I did finish Kin Porsche, which was great. And I am going to say the other thing that has taken over. Well, it didn't take over my life, but because it's only an hour long. But going back to BTS for, you know, a hot second, they've started to put out these vlogs and they're hour long and each member has a vlog. And they're going to be on different things. So like Jimin's doing bracelet making. J-Hope is going to do some sort of like self-affirmation workshop. Namjoon is going to go to an art museum. You know, Jungkook is going camping. So the first one out of the gate was V or Kim Taehyung. And he chose driving, <laughs> which is so hilarious to me. So he's just driving for an hour? He's just driving. <laughs> I saw that he was like I playing mean, does, with the cameras and he was like, you yeah, know, what he I mean? does a few things. It's just so funny because he is like so hot, like so like internationally famous for just being like attractive and cool. And he is just such a dork. And I think slightly like insecure when he's alone, not insecure, but just like doesn't really know what to do. <laughs> so he chose driving because I think it gave him something to do. And then he just plays music. And it's like he's like, here's the theme song to Paw Patrol. And then we rock out to that. And then it's like, <laughs> so here's cute. Bing Crosby. And we're singing to Bing Crosby. And then he's like, oh, shoot, I forgot. I need to go to the dentist because I hurt my tooth. So they do stop so he can go to his dental appointment where he's laying there with the face cover that they did in Hometown Cha Cha Cha. Oh, my gosh. They really do that. Yeah. And his little hands are like balled up. And afterwards, he's like, oh, I don't like the dentist. Anyway, I watched an hour of him. Literally, I was like, I just watched an hour of somebody who like went to the dentist and drove around. And I would do that. Yeah, I mean, I was not unpleased by the experience. <laughs> it was satisfying. It was satisfying. That's and awesome. I was like, this is crazy. But it's also I was like, how weird is it to be like, who knows how many amazing content creators there are in the world who are hoping to get like, you know, a couple views. And he's probably got like, at this point, I don't even know, like 20 million views for being like, right. I'm just driving and listening to Paw Patrol. Right. And also, like, imagine being that famous that 20 million people will watch you drive. And listen to Paw Patrol. You know I mean? And the other thing I don't get, and I mean, I know that this is all, like, handled in some way, but, like, one, he's driving, so I'm like, he's just pulling up at the stoplights next to people. Like, what do you do if you look over and you're like, oh, like, there's Kim Taehyung just, like, and then at another point, he goes to, like, a farmer's market and goes and buys some corn from, like, an old lady. And he's just, like, they're just buying his corn. Like, what's up? Buying the corn. And I'm like, you know, in the background, is there like 90,000 people standing around? Very possibly, yes. Or it could just be like, I have no idea how they do this. I mean, is it like somebody with a camera with him? I mean, the camera work is not amazing. So it looks like it's more like a very subtle thing. But it's somebody else has the yeah, camera, Yeah, yeah, he right? has so two it's... people. There were two other people in the car with him. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just funny. Anyway, so I was just going to yeah. throw that out that I did watch somebody drive in their car for an hour. So, you know, <laughs> take that as you will. Okay. So on that note, you know. Leah's going to get back to the crocodiles and... Yeah, I'll let you know if I get a flesh wound. Hopefully She's not. She's going to finish with her meat grinder, too, out there. <laughs> yeah, I think the body's all processed, so we're going to take that oh and God. actually feed it to the crocodiles. That's actually what's happening. Oh, okay, okay. You okay. know what? That's a strategy. So. Yeah, that would be a good murder mystery. Like, the people that, like, you know, like, yeah. It's a strangers from hell, but you go to, like, a hostel, like, up in far north Queensland, and they're... And you get your crocodile meat. Like, the crocodiles... They have the crocodiles in the backyard that they're <laughs> gnawing on the bones. They're like the Spido, oh just with oh a special God. bone. This is a lovely <laughs> note to end on. So That was the yeah, last great. person who stayed in the dorm. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm young. young. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to afternoonadelight.com. That's A-F-T-E-R-N-O-O-N-A-D-E-L-I-G-H-T 
www.kcskincare.com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K-pop and K-skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K-drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K-drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, Annyeong!